First of all, thank you, Wendy, for helping to put this together and for your leadership of uh, our session today. Um, it's a great honor to be on a panel with Bob and Helen, uh, two of my heroes. Uh, but let me start my comment with something uh, that President Obama said uh, yesterday, as a matter of fact. It was a different context, but uh, I think it's apt. He said, it's not going to be sufficient for us just to keep on doing the same things we've been doing and expect somehow that things are going to work themselves out. We're going to have to be creative and we're going to have to be engaged. We're going to have to look for the opportunities where the best impulses in the Middle East come to the fore and the worst impulses are weakened. I've actually been very encouraged by the attitudes that the international community has taken, uh, the international financial institutions, UNDP, and our own government towards the problems of Egypt, Tunisia, and the other states in the region. But as I look at the situation in Egypt and Tunisia, I am concerned that even with the utmost creativity and goodwill, we will be limited in what we can do to shape the Arab summer. I've been repeatedly over the ground of economic and political reform with Egyptian leaders and business people since 1994. First as ambassador, then as assistant secretary, then as an observing, observer heading the Middle East Institute, and more recently as the husband of a partner in a venture capital fund, Saweri Ventures, which is providing startup capital for new technology companies headed by young Egyptians. And what we in government observed in the mid-90s and in the non-governmental uh, sectors more recently is still largely true today. For all the talk of revolution and the many commentaries and pundits, things have not actually changed all that much in either Egypt or Tunisia, at least not yet. The problems that Egypt and Tunisia faced with Mubarak and Ben Ali all the way back to the 90s are virtually the same problems Egypt and Tunisia face today, only they don't have the bosses there. In fact, with the economic dislocations caused by protests in each country, solutions to their problems have become more difficult. In Egypt, Mubarak's role has been taken over by the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces. These are the very same military commanders who hold the very same views they held when serving under Mubarak for the last 30 years. The military is a status quo institution. It is suspicious of reform and jealous of its prerogatives. One could suggest that it is still sympathetic to the remaining political elements that support socialism and might even prefer to go back to the old Nasser system of state ownership, a system that still prevails in the 10 to 15% of the economy that the Egyptian military now controls. For its part, the civilian interim cabinet is composed of individuals who have been in government most of their careers, many of whom served in previous cabinets and in some of the same jobs. In reality, it is a caretaker cabinet of technicians and former ministers. They come to the jobs today with vast experience, but with agendas firmly set from the past. There is no firm hand on the economy as ministers are tending towards caution and seem understandably risk adverse given the number of accusations and indictments that the revolution has spawned. The Minister of Finance on one day announced the imposition of capital gains tax and on the next after the stock market took a nosedive rescinded the law. For investors where predictability is critical, this is not a good omen. At the same time, in Egypt, some six million state employees cling to their jobs and established patterns of doing business. We in aid and the U.S. government fought this bloated bureaucracy, which can ignore their bosses because they are insulated from accountability to the government or to the people. U.S. Supreme Court justices, university professors, and Egyptian civil servants all have a lifetime tenure. And today, the danger posed by unemployment gives added incentive for the government to sustain and even further enlarge the six million strong government workforce. Realistically, we can expect no reform of the bureaucracy given the current situation, 
where the youth represent 20% of the population and 90% of the unemployed and underemployed. Egypt produces 750,000 university graduates each year, but polls of university graduates suggest that 50% of them do not feel that they have been prepared for a workforce that can evolve from the state sector to the private sector. As a result, the majority of youth want jobs in the government. Asked in a natural, national survey about their sector of preference, 72% noted that working for the government is better than working for the private sector. Job security is the most prized and the public sector job carries with it respect. Young people have been quoted as referring disrespectfully to the treatment that they receive by employers in the private sector, invoking images of slavery as if they had been bought through. The private sector, which we had expected in the mid 90s to be the hope of the future is under a cloud today of former corruption. Just as government officials will be risk adverse now, so will private businessmen and women. In fact, the pressures against privatization and for, re for renationalization of some companies, which have already been privatized, are very strong today. While foreign assistance is important, critically, you might say, in both Egypt and Tunisia, particularly now, it is not a substitute for serious, locally driven economic reform. The question is whether the new generation of young people who sat in Tahrir Square will move these economies in new directions. In Tunisia, Baji Qayyid al Sibsi. Uh, was appointed Prime Minister of Tunisia after their revolution. He's an establishment figure, 84 years old. He hardly represents the youth.